Good evening and welcome to the shop here in beautiful, dark, but warm Canterbury. I'm excited tonight to share with you the topic of supercharging your router. All right, so we're not actually gonna do anything that exciting, but we are gonna show you how to use your router in conjunction with uh, the lathe in such a way as to create decorative elements on pieces like bedposts, like this. Uh, we've got, this is a, a reeded shape. We're not actually gonna focus on reeds tonight, but you can use your router on the lathe and create a reeded shape like this with the technique that I'm gonna show you. Um, also, this little, this is actually a cut off from quarter columns from a chest of drawers that I made some years ago. Uh, it was actually a whole round. So when you make the quarter columns like this, you glue up four quadrants with heavy paper between the quadrants and then turn, I don't know if you can see this, but that's actually a classic kind of Greek column uh, where you have beads down here and then you have these coves uh, all in, or sometimes it's called fluting. So they're a series of coves and separated. And then at the top, you have this other classic detail. This gets cut off. But then the, after you've turned it and cut your coves into this with this technique I wanna share with you, you then split the pieces apart. And because it's heavy paper, it just tears apart. And then you have the quadrants ready to glue in to the quarter columns. This is the, the type of bit that we're gonna be using. I think they technically call it a box core bit, but I always think of it as a cove bit, uh, just because it, it has no bearing or anything on the end and you can cut a straight cove. However, I believe it's used to plunge into boxes more commonly and to route the interior and create that inside rounded corner. But we're gonna use it on the lathe and just to show you the method. So let's get started. Um, what I wanna show you is this, this hunk of material. Wow. This is a, uh, an example of one that I made some time ago. This was a, a series of legs underneath a, um, a large table that was a, kind of a side table, had a stone top. And this is not the material it was made of, but I usually do turn a piece to work out the details and how it's gonna work before cutting into the good material. Um, I think this one was actually made in chestnut, so it was pretty sweet with a uh, green granite top. So anyway, to work this out, um, I've got, here I've got 12 flutes here, and this was the largest kind of fluted column, you know, dimensionally that I had made, you know, the, in diameter. And so I wanted to work it out, and let me show you the, how to set up to make any kind of reeded and fluted column. And then we'll see it just about cutting a few flutes in a piece to give you an idea of how it works. I've got actually two things to share with you tonight. I'm gonna to share quickly with the fluted, then we're going to go to a fun little wow. gift type thing that you could give to someone special. Anyway, here's the secret weapon. So there's a lot of different ways to do this. You can actually do this without a lathe, but I wanna to focus tonight on using the lathe and not the other method, because the other method requires building a box and um, great to have. It will be useful if you're not a lathe type person. But the key to doing this is to set up, a, to build a simple kind of jig like this that holds your router at 90 degrees, horizontal like that. And the key to it working is that the height of this platform jig orients the center of your router bit aligned so that it's aligned with the center axis of your lathe. So usually you'll just measure right off the bed of your lathe up to the center point. And a lot of them are like eight. This is an eight inch 
this has what's called an eight inch swing. So it's eight inches from the center point to the top of the bed. That's pretty good size, you know, for, um, think of it like half of the radius of a bowl. Like if you turn a bowl on here, you could get nearly a 16 inch bowl right on this inside face. So bowl turners think of that a lot. Like what's the swing of a, a lathe like that. This lathe actually has almost not unlimited, but over a four foot swing. If you think the whole entire head will turn 180 degrees. So you can turn on the outboard here and you can get quite a, quite a radius there. However, we're focused on that distance. So you want to just build this box to a 90 degree. Now it's a simple, you have sidewalls. Well, you have a platform on the bottom and you're just going to make that a little wider than your router base. So see, I've already mounted the router in here to save time, but you just, I just use half inch plywood. You could use three quarter. That would be fine. And then you're going to have this base a little wider than the circle and then just come up and you're going to cut out a circle at the center point of your lathe. So you're going to make this upright high enough to accommodate, to get to the center and then add for the additional uh, diameter of your router plate. So you can work right directly off the bed with this type of jig, but I prefer for stability's sake to put some type of uh, primary table on the base. I mean, on the bed of the lathe, give yourself larger area to work out. Then your jig is not as tipsy. Okay. So I put a piece of MDF on here. It used to be on another lathe downstairs. So when I came up here, I found that I had to raise it up a little over half an inch so that this same setup would get centered. So it was nice. I didn't have to rebuild this. I just added, but once you're set up and you've got that at 90, you know, I, I cut the side walls with sweeping angles so that they wouldn't be obstructive in any way to whatever diameter piece I had on here while I was going to cut the flute. So you can already guess how this works. I, I'm going to come in and I'm going to butt against the workpiece and then slide it along and make my flute. Now, this is, would be quite large. We're going to uh, limit the depth of cut here. I could back it off and get a, uh, and just have the workpiece slide right on the plate. But with little pieces like this, I've just gotten in the habit, you know, because you're coming into this and then you're hitting these larger turned elements, a lot of times that's what you're doing. It's, it hel it's helpful just to put a piece of um, secondary kind of surface for, to bear against the workpiece rather than the plate. So we're going to put some narrower pieces. I'll just tack these on. I'm going to just bring these in. These are just two half inch pieces and I'm going to just hold them vertically and tack them in place here with my little pin nailer. And there's nothing fancy about them. I'm just bringing them up kind of close to the cutter so that what's going to happen is the workpiece is going to rub here. After we cut the cove, it's actually going to want to go a little deeper so you can go over it twice um, once you finish cutting the cove. Let me show you this one. I just did a very simple kind of little block that spins here. I'll have to slide it out to show you. No. This plate here is, goes with something I'm, I'm going to show you. It's, it's a template. If you're already uh, guessing, um, that'll be coming, but just imagine this is not on here. This is just a flat table. That's how I use it initially. Okay. And then the way I, once I get my flat table, I find that it's easy if you, if you rip a piece, these pieces here are ripped a little narrower than the, the opening on my lathe bed. Okay. They're just under two inches. So they just fit in there without binding. 
but that helps me index right on. So these both slip in, it gives me a nice indexing. Then these blocks, they just go in and they turn and then I tighten them and it locks this thing to the bed. This piece of plywood right here is what I had to add on. This used to be the original bed. It was just a piece of three quarter inch MDF. And I added this and then I put these blocks so that it would drop in and index into the table like that. Okay, so let's snug that down. Okay, so now um, we're gonna get back to our router. We've got our little side bases to rub, to bear against the workpiece when we cut and we need a workpiece. So what I did was I turned a piece of pine earlier. It was just a chunk I had, so I just turned it round and I thought we could experiment on it. Okay, so now I've got that bit out, not even an eighth of an inch, but that's gonna give us a pretty strong flute. It may be too much, but here's something I want you to see. Most lathes come with some type of indexing system. So this one, if you uh, can look right here, these three holes uh, give you an opportunity to index the head. I don't know, look in the light, you can see a, can you see that secondary hole inside when I rotate this? I kind of see it. This pin goes in and it lodges in a hole and it'll hold the piece in position. And that's what you want when you're gonna route like this, you wanna hold it stably. But more than that, it's indexed so that this top pinhole, if you just use that one and then you rotate until you fall into the next one, the top one is, is set up so that you have 12 indexing holes to go around the 360 degrees. So you end up with 12 flutes for that one. Mm -hmm. I forget what the second and third one. Most lathes just have one singular indexing head with quite often it was a bunch of pinholes, like almost like a cribbage board in a circular manner, but with all the holes equally spaced. And usually it's divisible by three, you know, um, so, or two, I guess. So you can do, you could do 12, you could do six, you could do um, all kinds of numbers there to break it up. But 12 is fairly common, you know, you're just gonna, get whatever you need into the space. So here, I'm gonna just start with this and let's just try cutting a little groove down this end um, and see how it goes. We may have to reset it up. It's not very deep, but I'm gonna try a second one. Let's see how this looks. Not bad. Um, usually the fillet or the flat area between the, the beads is, I mean the coves is small. It's gonna, you want it smaller than the main. So that this, that classic one that I showed you of the, uh, like a Greek column, you can really get a sense. I really studied these things. I remember visiting Washington, D.C. You can go to school on these columns all day. I mean, there's so many beautiful uh, 
Greek revival type buildings there. I'm going to just plunge the route a bit a little more. Let's just take a look at it. If we go a little bit deeper, how much difference that will make. It doesn't take a lot because everything's kind of doubled in appearance. Let's, let's go back to those two and we'll check out what difference we can make here. All right, that's for the one we just had. I wasn't used, when I got this lathe, I wasn't used to having the index here. Mo all the lathes I've had have had it out here, like a Conover lathe. And then I, I've had a number of others too that, it was always out there. The old Delta lathes. Here we go. All right, so check that out. I like the spacing a little better. I'd probably go even more to make those a little narrower, but you can see I had a little bobble right there. And that's why I like practicing and figuring it out. That happened and I didn't like have that flare of um, blood pressure, <laughs> <laughs> like we all know well. Uh, anyway, um, but what I did was I learned too that how that could happen when I was coming back this way. I don't know if it's because I was climbing, but I was, I was focusing more on pressing against the piece. And by doing that, I actually pushed, because I was bearing there, I, I gave it a little wheelie like this <laughs> by pushing too hard on the base. So I realized all of my pressure has to be focused up here. Otherwise I could, I could lift it un unintentionally. And that's what happened there. But there, you get an idea, that's the technique. Um, and now I wanna show you an additional way to use your router like this. You could do it a lot of different ways, but it's basically turning your router into a duplicator jig. So we're going to use our lathe to create duplicates quickly. Now, I came across this idea for making these rolling pins. Now, here's just a straight rolling pin. This would not be hard to make without the use. We did a video use... on that. What's that? We did a video on that one year. Oh, we did? Oh, here's a straight one. Uh, this one is not complicated. This one is 
the French style, so it has the curvature. But this one, to achieve that curvature, that subtle, you know, it goes from approximately an inch and three quarters in the middle down to an inch and a quarter at each end. The overall length is 20 and a half inches for this one. I did a lot of research when I finally decided to go with that dimension. This is a really cool one, and you've used it a lot on rolling out different doughs, right? Mostly pizza, yes. Pizza doughs, yeah. So which one, I mean, did you prefer the flat one or this one? It's hard to know. But I, the, I did come to prefer the, the flat one because it just was easier for me personally. But yeah, I but like this, the French one looks nicer. I think the French one is more, lends itself more to pastry dough where you have that kind of real density mm -hmm. because because of the curvature, it had this pushing out action yeah. more than just trying to press the whole load like in the yeah. same way, yeah. right? Yeah. So there was something about that geometry of it that makes better pastry rolling. So it's good to have both, actually. Tom, um, um, Tony's asking how you prevent or sand out the burn in, in at the end of the flute. Ah, uh, um, I used, I used to use, that's a good question. First of all, you want to, you don't want to spend, you want to spend as little time at the end of the flute as possible. And that's one of the things you'll work out when you're practicing. Um, but let me see if I got any of these things. I don't know if I have them. Um, these are all the wrong shape, but these little rubber gadgets, these are real helpful to sand beads. So you would wrap like this in sandpaper and it would conform nicely to that size bead. And you can get them in sets like that and that's fine for beads, but you're asking about cove and how to get to the end of the cove. Well, they make the opposite shape. This is the largest one. They come smaller. Um, that's what I was trying to find with the smaller ones. So you can usually find in the set, they're, they're like a hard rubber, which works really nice. I just wrap them with sandpaper and go right up into the end. If you don't have these or you can't, you can't find the right size, you can use a dowel. And often I would just blunt the end of the dowel and wrap it with sandpaper and get up in there. And you could knock that off fairly rapidly or um, even quick, more, a quicker process is if you have the right carving chisel to conform with that cove, you can just very subtly skim mm -hmm. it right at the end. That's, and you're gonna be coming from the high side down obviously and then lightly detail and sand it. So you just gotta work out a method. There again is a great reason to have the, the practice piece first and get your, your approach dialed in before you go to the good stuff. Okay, so let's move on. I wanna just show you the process. So I set up a process to make these fast because they turned out to be really great gifts. Let me just show you really rapidly here how fast it can go. But this is a, um, a prepped block I had that's, I think it's inch and five, six, 15 sixteenths. I've already centered it and ripped the octagon with a method that I made a video on to make octagons really fast. Um, but now let's head on over to the lathe here. I'm just gonna make a little, this is my center line. I'm just gonna make some, these are roughing it out. Before using the jig, I wanna rough out round. So I would get, if I was, let's say I was making 10 of these, I'd have 10 of these already and I would take them all through this process, rough them out and then go to that process and get the advantage of batching. I'm just going to go in with my parting tool, set the depth to like a 16th larger than an inch and three quarters because that's going to be my final depth on the and then I'll go a 16th larger than an inch and a quarter at each of these points. Then I'm just going to quickly rough it down, staying a little heavy, but going down to those points. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna just go for it. Okay. 
Okay. And lastly, get that last one. Okay, now that I got my depth set, I can just comfortably make the, uh, I gotta lubricate that thing, that's a little sticky. Let's shoot some at you. Oops, try not to go off the end. Don't have to be fancy here. That's about right. Go back to the other side. You can really get in a groove doing this though. Here we go. Okay, that's good enough. So it's not perfect, but when you're turning a French rolling pin, that's the hard part is to get this beautiful symmetry, which you want. So it takes time. If you, you could turn it all by hand, obviously doing something what I just did, and you could pare it down and do it pretty rapidly. But you can also just without thinking, quickly rough it out like this, and then you do a bunch of them, and you would head over to your duplicator setup. Here's the shape we're after, and we're trying to get that nice symmetry. So what I did was, I made a template, and check it out. That's what you've been looking at down on the table. This is the center line of my rolling pin, okay? And let's say I'm an inch and three quarters here, I'm an inch and a quarter here. So, I'm a half inch larger in the middle. So the template is only half, it's only showing one side of it off of the center. So this is only one quarter inch larger than this point here, okay? That gets doubled because it happens on the other side as well. So then you end up with a half inch difference in diameter, you know, given this template. So if you wanted to lay out the template, that's what you would do, you would get a center point and you just bring it down a quarter inch to that outer point. Remember, my rolling pin is 20 and a half inches long. It's not a set rule, but the longer ones are nice because you can really cover more ground. It's okay if it's not round as much from the end in. So anyway, when you make your template, what I did was I had, I did half of it and I flipped it and I got it onto this hard piece of masonite. So that got tacked onto my base. And then if you check it out, I applied the same thickness masonite, but this is just a straight cut. So that 
bears against that curve and I just slide it right along and it's going to cut that exact curve above with the piece I just roughed out chucked into the lathe. So let's go ahead and chuck it in there. That's some nice uh, wood chips down my shirt. They feel really good right now. <laughs> Can you repeat the dimensions of the rolling pin length? That's why you want a high collar. <laughs> you said 20 and a quarter inches long, and what was the, the one inch and a half? Inch and three back? quarters in the middle. Okay. And that's fine to go a little smaller than that. You don't, it, uh, and an inch and a quarter out at the ends. Okay. Inch and and when I turn it, when I cut it down, I give it a slight kind of roundedness on the end and polish the end. And then I just give it more mineral oil, or you can use... Um, um, other food grade waxes. Oh gosh. Anyway, I'm going to set this up now. Check it out. I've got all the, you got to get all your particles out. I want to make sure I've set the depth right. I did change that depth a minute ago. So I only want that to protrude about seven sixteenths of an inch. So I'm going to just set that up best as I can see it here. I found, have found to run it from left to right while the piece is spinning toward me works best. Uh, it, going this way, it wanted to climb and it wasn't as smooth a cut. And you also want to have the piece spinning, but not fast. I have it about 500 RPMs, could even go a little slower than that, and then just move nice and easy along and you'll get a nice, relatively smooth cut. You'll have to sand it after, but it establishes the shape without you fussing with it. So here we go. Okay, so I'm right around 480, 500. Here we go. That's it. Got our shape perfectly dialed in there. Now we can go to the lathe, the other lathe. I gotta get using the same. So you, 
you would just run several of them like that and you can knock them out pretty fast when you're getting the repetition and then you come back to your other lathe I mean you may break it down and then just sand on the same lathe or you can go to a another one you actually need another lathe you can see that if I put a straight edge on there there is a roll to it but it does kind of flatten out as compared to the middle has has the greatest kind of arc to it the transition but then it gets close to straight that last bit and that's why you can use the rolling pin to lay it up it's one of the features I think that they they naturally have is they are a little flatter as you get out to the ends now the sanding process you could speed up the lathe but I'll just leave it on that speed I'm going to start with some 150 um, it's a little sponge for the heat. Now, I'm showing you sanding because there is a, a technique here. So it's pretty clean. You could start with 100 grit, but you don't need any coarser than that. And then the, the key to removing the scratches before you go to the next grit, moving them, removing them quickly, is not just now going to the next grit. Because there are some scratches I can see from this paper. But you want to sand with the grain, with that paper before you move to the next grit and this will quickly take out those scratches okay so it's just like regular wood you have to go with the grain before you go to the next grit okay that looks good now this is uh, this is like regular 150 paper I'll just hit this quickly. Once again, with the grain. You can really make quick work of sanding these if you use this technique. And then you can hit it with 220. Is one end wider than the other, or is that just what the camera's catching, Tom? I think I just went further on one end. Yeah. Um, okay. They are, this is actually like uh, 23 inches long. So I'm cutting off, you know, a good inch and a quarter off each end. So I just went further on this end. But there you have it. You could sand to 320 if you'd like, but then I'll, I'll get them all to this point. Then I'll mark the ends and turn that end right, you know, and then I'll have... Um, I'll give it that little bit of a radius and take it off and sand it, buff polish it on the end. Uh, that's in the other video, I believe. So you can check that out uh, if you want to make some rolling pins. The nice thing is you're going to put a bunch of mineral oil on there and it just works beautifully and you'll have yourself a, a really nice gift. So that was poplar. I wouldn't use poplar, but I like something harder without a lot of pores you want a close grain wood so something like maple hard maple is great because it has good weight to it um, walnut's a porous wood slightly so i would stick with the hard maple you could use cherry it's a little softer but stick you know birch would be awesome too so <laughs> there's a lot of woods out there close grain harder makes the best all right, everyone, thank you so much for hanging out with us. I hope you enjoyed those 
tips for supercharging your router, for fluting, and also some template work on your router to make some nice, sweet, simple gifts. On behalf of the camera lady and myself, we look forward to seeing you next time.